2011. We are on the ground in Las Vegas. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com. I'm here with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org, and this is our continuous coverage of VMworld Live 2011. And we're here with David Flynn, the CEO of Fusion IO, and uh, his new employee, or soon to be new employee, <laughs> Rich Boberg, uh, CEO of IO Turbine. Uh, a recent, uh, you guys recently announced the acquisition of IO Turbine. So welcome, gentlemen. Oh, thank you. Thank thanks, you very Dave. much, thanks, John. David. Thanks for coming back to the to the cube. Hey, it's we, good to be here. It was fun last time. Had yeah, a so, whirlwind uh, for you. So first of all, I want to ask, how's it feel? Very humble last year in the cube, telling your story, predicting the future. SSD yeah. is hot. Valuations are off the charts from the VCs. They're investing in everything that moves. You guys went public. <laughs> so tell us, what was it like last year for you? I, uh, last year was a whirlwind. It really was a. Um, an amazing journey to get this far, and it's really just the beginning. I mean, that's that's what it takes to get to the starting line, you know, is, is to get to where you're a public company, and it was just amazing to do that with such a great team along the way. Yeah, so um, the we've been, as you know, tracking this business pretty closely. Um, there's a lot of confusion about Flash. Oh, yeah. There? Um, it's the Wild West, I like to say, because it's it, such a new technology that people is. haven't really formulated in their mind kind of a way to categorize or understand the different ways to use it. It's like, everybody uses disk drives, but that doesn't make them EMC and NetApp, right? So everybody uses Flash, that, that doesn't make them Fusion I.O. There, there are very big differences in business models, in uh, architectures, you know, in, in, uh, in how, you're, you know, how you use the Flash from a technical perspective, how you interact with customers, all those things. Yeah, yeah and you guys are really a, a systems company, you know, first. You're, I don't really look people at you People are starting course, to understand that. They got, you know, our system is a distributed system. It has componentry that's scattered throughout all of your servers. It's like taking a storage array, dicing it into a thousand pieces, and putting it in your servers. But you can't go back to the days of direct attached storage where you're managing each server as an island unto itself, which is why the real challenge isn't just creating the hardware that's capable of housing large quantities of data with very rapid access. The challenge is how do you now run a distributed system where the data gets uh, diffused to the right server at the right right place, right time? And that's really where the acquisition of IO Turbine comes in and we're so pleased to have uh, Rich Boberg and uh, Vikram join us because they had a similar vision on uh, on how to manage in a virtualized environment the supply chain of data. Well, and, and, and Rich, I, 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 we've seen the, you know, you're, as a former spinning rust person, right, we saw <laughs> the, the hierarchy in the 80s and the 90s start to get pretty granular. We're seeing similar things with Flash now, right? We've got yeah. server class memory, you know, all the way down to devices that emulate dis disks. So the IO turbine a acquisition was very interesting because I think it's recognition that the, you know, the, the Fusion I.O., classic Fusion I.O. approach isn't going to be all things to all people. Right. Um, and, and so I.O. Turbine comes in. Rich, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about I.O. Turbine. For those who don't know the company, um, you know, take us back to the beginning, what your vision was, and you've obviously seen that through to, to an exit, but, but give us a quick snapshot. Sure, so I.O. Turbine was recognizing the need for flash in the virtualized environment. Uh, it's a systems business in the non-virtualized environment. A virtualized server is an order of magnitude more complex. It's instantly uh, uh, systems business on steroids. Our approach was to go after the, the uh, I.O. performance issue, not the, the CPU hypervising or the memory hypervising, but the I.O. performance hypervising. And we needed software to bring flash into that server and to address that 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 basic bottleneck in the uh, in the hypervisor world, in the virtualized world. So so we've got this um, hierarchy developing, mm -hmm. server class uh, flash. Yep. Let's call it with with VSL. Uh, uh, you were talking about eliminating the whole. We, we view that as kind of a hypervisor for data. It, it houses data from multiple origins, virtualizes that the same way the VMware hypervisor hypervises the computational resources uh, okay. and memory resources. And what's so cool, if I can you know, uh, talk up what they do, because sometimes it's harder <laughs> to talk about what you do. It's just it's totally cool. What they do is they actually have built the para-virtualization infrastructure to capture the IOs before they even go through the guest operating system and to tunnel them down into where they can get access through the VSL into the flash and serve. So what this means is you can actually serve IOs in a way that bypasses not just most of the, 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 the ESX hypervisor IO stack, but also most of the guest. Actually captures them above even the file system. So it creates that 
that para-virtualized tunnel for the I.O. down in. So you guys love end running overhead. I'm, it, well I'm that, noticing that. We, we are all about <laughs> high potency flash. How do you get flash to render the most benefit? Because it costs on a per unit capacity. So what you want to do is accentuate what it can do. And, and this, the results have been phenomenal. Uh, with our you know, beta sites, what we've seen is between three and six times the workload per server. Now that can be used to put three to six times as many virtual machines on that server or in some ways even better, is to get more workload on each individual machine. So now instead of sitting there idle most of the time, your Microsoft SQL Server, your Exchange, can get, get more throughput, right? So no matter how you boil it down, when you can do six times as much workload on the server, it's cutting to one-sixth the effective cost of the entire equation. So let's break down that hierarchy, and, and we've put this out on Wikibon, I don't know if you agree or disagree with it, but at the, at the, at the lowest level, I talked about disk emulation, SSD, like a stack drive and an EMC device. That's kind of for legacy applications. That's right. right? Yeah. And, and then, then we're seeing this sort of flash cache, you're seeing that in hardware and software and different, different combinations, and, and that's really where, more where IO Turbine fits. Yeah, if, if you think about it, um, we're trying to treat flash more like memory than like storage, than yeah. like a disk drive. And you wouldn't put your DRAM on the other side of a storage network. Right. You would want your DRAM right next to your applications. So that's where the flash can really be used. It's uh, two orders of magnitude faster than spinning disk. And so just the latency going across a storage network would slow it down. So you really want it right next to the application. And what we do is cache the IO accesses, really the dynamic aspect of the uh, storage next to the applications. We leave the, uh, the primary storage, the big storage systems, as the repository for the static image of the data. But if you really want to solve the performance issue, you want to move that closer. Yeah, and cost-wise, you're not going to compete with you know, SATA bit buckets. You know, no, least, it's not for capacity. This is not for data at soon. rest. This is for data that's in motion. But, but then you've got this all flash block-based storage that's targeting like you know the classic you know symmetrics and IBM DS. Well, you know people have always used RAM quite effectively to speed up those storage arrays too. So flash really doesn't stand to have as great of an impact on the storage array itself because people already use battery-backed RAM for the for the cache. Right. What really the you know the, the the bulk majority of the RAM market though has been in the server, right? Memory used in the server is, is always uh, more valuable than on the far end of a network. And it has to do with just the, the shipping costs. You know, you don't want to you don't want to have to send a ship to China every time you need a new piece of material for right. your for for your uh, assembly line. Okay, and then at the highest level then you've got the the, the fusion IO, the classic fusion IO, and then mm -hmm. of course you take us but then bring in VSL and now you're eliminating disk protocol overheads. That's, that's right. The, we don't have to go through bottom. microcontrollers that emulate disk IO. And the higher you go up that hierarchy the more expensive it is, but so you're talking about getting value out of those applications, right? So that is that a reasonable way to look yeah. at the landscape out there? Yeah, you're playing in now a big swath of that with. Well, it, and it also ties into our uh, um, our ability to support enterprise customers with a direct sales and support team. It's kind of ironic that um, my customer support team spends more of their time fixing the other stuff that breaks when you push mm -hmm. servers to do this kind of workload. I mean, it's uh, it's amazing that you can get six times the amount of usable work from a server. It speaks to the fact that they're sitting there starved for data most of the time, but they're not used to running at 100% utilization. David, talk about your co competition and then your, your customer base. I mean, I know you're a public company, so you sure. really can't go into too much detail on the customer base, but um, since you've been so successful, you're attracting competition across the board, obviously direct yep. competition and indirect competition. Um, talk about that, and then talk about your customer base and how that's changing and sure. evolving as you're growing. Let's take both those questions. First, competition. We compete on four different spheres because we're a systems company, but this is a new market, so we're vertically integrated because the pieces up and down the stack didn't exist before. So we started with building a hardware platform, attaching NAND flash like a memory, which to do that required building software to teach the OS how to use it. That's VSL. Those form the kind of the foundation, like the hypervisor for the data piece. Um, but at the same time, we were building the, um, the sales and support and the ability to sell solutions directly to end users in creating this new value chain, establishing new partners with the OEM server vendors, with the OS application vendors where all of this has to be embedded inside of the OS. 
And so we view these as kind of four concentric circles. The hardware itself, where we excel, but it's actually kind of the least interesting. It's the software stack within the OS to virtualize Flash as a memory, and then it's the systems level software that runs the distributed system. That's where IO Turbine fits in, Direct Cache fits in, IO Sphere that manages the distribution and flow of data. But probably more important than all of that is the um, sales and go to market and business model of not being a component vendor and not being subject to somebody else's route to market. Because the, the, the realization was that existing systems vendors are kind of compromised. The value proposition that they're used to selling has a different formulation and this is in conflict to it. And so we said this is an opportunity for us to take a value proposition right to the folks who benefit from it most and not be conflicted by the fact that you know storage guys want to still spend or want people to spend a lot for premium storage. Server vendors want to sell a lot of servers. So it's, you know, it's kind of how do, you, how do you do that? You have to get in there and, and make the case yourself with the end users. Now two customers, uh, obviously Facebook and Apple are 10% customers, um, you know, big cloud players. Do you see those guys as, as outliers or is that sort of the future of the data center? So our customer base is a full spectrum. Uh, very few companies rise to the consumption potential of <laughs> Facebook and Apple. That's why they stand out. Yeah, but right. in reality, it's a spectrum, mm -hmm. kind of a pyramid. You know, there are deals in this case that are in the, in the many tens of millions of dollars. There are deals in the millions of dollars. There are deals in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, and at the bottom end of the spectrum, you know, we have customers who um, would have had to been facing deploying an expensive storage array and drop in a card for a mere $10,000, $20,000 and no longer need to go to an expensive high performance storage array to support their infrastructure. So the spectrum is huge. Uh, those two are uh, simply the, the, the tips of the iceberg that poke up you know, from, from the foundation. But we have over 1,500 customers to date and that's squarely in enterprise business, largely around database, but also unstructured text and basically anything that needs big data. With virtualization now supported, we can even address those applications that aren't inherently data intensive, but become such when you bundle them together. And uh, this allows you to remove that bottleneck so you can consider, continue to consolidate. That makes it not just a performance play, but also a cost effectiveness and consolidation play. Yeah, so you've got a big TAM. Um, but do you see those, those outliers, those huge companies, as indicators of the future, or do you see oh, those you bet. worlds as, you bet. as, as being? I mean, separate? those guys are the ones that are looking at how do they run their infrastructure in the most efficient way possible. They're the ones that stand the most to gain from understanding these things, and it's 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 fun working with them because because they are out there. And, and you know, with the uh, with the economy the way it is recently, it it has led more companies to go and look, is there a better way to do it? Is there a more cost of way, effective way to do it? In good times, the adage, you know, nobody gets fired for buying IBM, that holds true. In bad times, when budgets are tight, yeah. you might have to lay somebody well, else if you want let, to continue spending let's talk about, on the let's, same Let's talk about innovation. You mentioned innovation about the product and the business model. Um, it's very Apple-esque, and when Steve Jobs announced his resignation, um, Steve Wozniak went on Piers Morgan Mm -hmm. and talked a little bit about it, but he couldn't stop talking about Fusion I.O. <laughs> and you. So how do you feel about that? I mean, Steve yeah. Jobs, Apple, a legend, and the Waz praising you guys big time. So talk a comment on that. Sure, so first, Steve Wozniak is an engineer's engineer. He, that's the highest calling in life, and he is an amazing individual. When it came to our engagement with Apple, he stayed out of it. He didn't want to be involved, you know, because of, of optics and you know, how it might look and so forth. So he really didn't have anything directly to do with it. Um, but you know, he came and fell in love with Fusion IO. The, the two questions he asked when we first sat down, a, a you know, series of coincidences led us to having lunch. And, uh, and he said, okay, two things. I've loved solid state. Moving electrons makes a lot more sense than moving atoms. And so I've always paid premiums to buy you know, the newest and greatest solid state stuff. So, why is solid state going mainstream now? And what is it that makes you different? And the answer was, solid state is going mainstream now because NAND flash has the ability to have 100 times the capacity density as RAM because it doesn't give off power and it's natively higher density. So the only reason we're here is because NAND flash makes a better memory. Um, Making a faster disk, you could do that with RAM all the time, right? It's the fact that it's a higher density memory, a good enough memory that actually um, has some advantages in being non-volatile. So that was the answer number one. 
is NAND flash, displaced RAM, has much higher density today because of consumer electronics. Apple driving the volume of the flash, right? So then the, um, the second thing was, why are you different? And we, we told them that we looked at it from first principles and said, if storage as we knew it today, if the data supply methodologies that are used today didn't exist, how would you employ flash? And we came to the conclusion that it's two primary things. You would attach it like a memory and not go through the emulation of disk drives using microcontrollers. And number two, that would lead to the need to run a distributed supply chain of data. This is like Walmart. Walmart runs a supply chain that's very efficient because they have local distribution hubs. Their distribution efficiency is what makes them as a company. This is all about distribution of data within the data center and you're not going to do it from shipping everything from the same central location every single time. And so that, that inversion principle is what really led us to think this is going to be a sea change and the amount of technologies that are going to have to be developed to manage a distributed supply chain is going to be immense. Awesome, uh, David Flynn, Rich Boberg. Great story. Uh, great story, thanks for coming on theCUBE again. Uh, David Flynn, a super techie turned CEO. <laughs> we love, that. We love that, that path. Thanks. And Rich Boberg, old friend, you know, glad to see everything worked out great for you guys. Congratulations on the IPO. Way to go in the first quarter. You know, now just do it 100 times more in a row. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Congratulations. Good. Thanks all very right. much. Thanks very much.